Thank you for tuning in to uh, Alethea Bible Fellowship. Uh, today's sermon is uh, continuing on the series of Pride of Life, uh, specific to identity and uh, racism. We deal today with critical race theory worldview versus the Christian worldview. Hope that you enjoy this video. If you need more information about this or our other sermons, you can find that at our website at abfpdx.org. Uh, so today we're going to continue to uh, you know, explore the subject that we started on last week, which is pride of life identity. Uh, specifically, uh, we're looking, of course, this year at discernment, being able to discern from the inputs that we receive what is from God and what is not of God. Uh, and in some cases, that may seem pretty easy to, to figure out. Uh, but in others, uh, it deals with uh, subjects that are near and dear to our hearts or that stir our emotions, that, um, you know, just, it just seems to, to dwell on us, right? Uh, some of these things and the way that they're couched and the way that they're presented to us, uh, the opinions, the, the different facts, the things that are used, um, just it, it seems to be held out there as a very, very attractive bait for us to want to jump on board. Uh, specifically for this month, we're going to continue to talk about uh, the pride of life and identity in relation to race and social justice and those types of things. So we, we talked last week about how justice is defined in the Bible. If we're going to venture into this world and the different inputs that are there, we have to start with a clear foundation and understanding of what God's Word says about things so that we are prepared prepared and, and hardened and ready for whatever would be thrown our way. So some of the things that we discovered when we looked at defining uh, justice in a biblical manner uh, was, well, I got about six different attributes that we discussed last week. Uh, one, that uh, justice is in God's very character. Um, it is part of who God is. Uh, thusly, God himself cannot be unjust, and God cannot change to, uh, you know, lop off justice. That, that is part of who he is. Uh, since uh, God is the creator of all things, God is and sets, therefore, the definition for justice. Uh, it is part of who he is. Therefore, since there is nothing that we can define God by, we must define justice by God. Now, interesting, I mean, that one pretty much covers everything that you see in the world, right? You've got to start there. God also judges everyone based on their own merit. And justice is applied equally to all people. We also looked then, saw that the attribute of justice, uh, biblically, it also offers opportunity for redemption and reconciliation. And lastly, the most important thing was that justice includes grace. All of these things are attributes that we looked at from a biblical perspective and saw as applied to what justice is. Where does that leave us? Now, as Christians, we are... <clears throat> well, we're, we're supposed to be on the side of justice. We're supposed to seek justice. In fact, when we see uh, unjust uh, things occurring, when we uh, have uh, uh, you know, an idea of things that are going on that um, just, it, it's not right, right. We're supposed to be um, proponents of change towards just in some way, shape, or form. Uh, if you look at how the Bible describes the, the New Testament church in the beginning, uh, people coming together, making sure that uh, those who had need were taken care of, those that could work were working towards the benefit not just of themselves but the group. Uh, you know, people selling off uh, land and, and houses that they had in order to support uh, the greater community and the, the church. Uh, knowing that they as well would be supported by this. Thinking of others instead of thinking of self. 
Uh, those are all things that are modeled for us uh, in the Bible. The world, of course, has its counterfeits for those, right? Everything that you see in the Bible that is good and right and just, there is a counterfeit that the world would offer to you and say, this is good, this is right, this is just. Uh, the problem is, is when you remove God from that and you begin from a new base, a new foundation, it is destined to run afoul of God and God's justice. So where does that really leave us then? How are we to discern what it is that we are supposed to run after full force, to uh, take care of, to work towards, versus what we're supposed to stay away from? How do we deal with those types of decisions? The big thing, as I made mention to, is this idea of social justice. It's not enough to say justice anymore. You have to add a descriptor to it. Um, so today, we're going to take a look at so-called social justice, or better yet, critical social justice, to see what it is that those uh, who purport that uh, have to offer in that regard, what it is that uh, they push for, and how that relates to what we already understand justice to be from a biblical perspective. Uh, so I'm going to uh, basically spend some time uh, you know, constructing for you what it is that, that social justice is and, and where even the term comes from. Because you know me, I like to start with a good definition. Um, <clears throat> I believe that part of the problems in this world is that we have taken things and we have adjusted their definitions to fit what we want them to instead of what the standards are. It makes it so difficult to figure out what people are actually talking about. Uh, they throw around social buzzwords. They say things and you're like, oh yeah, I agree, and then they reveal what they're truly intending to communicate to you, and you're like, whoa, wait a second. So what is it that social justice is, actually? Uh, the term social justice is said to originate with uh, the Jesuit priest Luigi Taparelli di Azeglio. I don't speak Italian, so I, I pray that they'll forgive me in that. Because this was in 1840, and it was based on the teaching of Thomas Aquinas. The term was used to refer to ordinary and traditional conceptions of justice applied to constitutional arrangements of society. So at the time, his concept was considered a significant contribution to conservative political philosophy. In fact, social justice was even given a section in the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. And it defined it as uh, society ensures social justice when it provides the conditions that allow associations or individuals to obtain what is their due according to their nature and their vocation. Social justice is linked to the common good and exercise of authority. So far, so you know what we've learned is well, there's a lot of big words in there, right? But basically, the concept of social justice, as it originated, had to do with the common good for people based on their due. Uh, another way to put that is uh, based on the the character of their output what it is that they produce in life, and making sure that because they put forth just effort, they receive just rewards for those efforts. And it was not only the, uh, the goal of uh, individuals, but goal of society, uh, including like government and, and that type of thing, to ensure that people received their just due. 70s, a publication of John Rawls uh, called A Theory of Justice, uh, the term became associated with more of a liberal secular political philosophy, particularly changing social institutions. So particularly going not from individuals and their due, but from society and how society runs to ensure that people get their due. Rawls wrote, 
Our concern is solely with the basic structure of society and its major institutions, and therefore with the standard cases of social justice. See, part of the problem that we run into when we're trying to define words is they're, they, they change, right? Uh, you can look back at some of the words that you used uh, when you were younger, and if you try to use them today, you may get some weird looks. Uh, the other day, for example, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, here I am, I did this. The other day I referred to someone as a simp. Now in my day, in fact, you can go back to 1992 when Sir mix uh, put out Baby Got Back. Good references, you know, solid Christian references, right? Uh, he refers to people as uh, simps that want to leave their girl after getting what it is that they wanted out of the relationship. I think that's the best The word simp day and age means something a little bit different. In fact, it has to do with being under the thumb of another person that you're in a relationship with. Unable to make any type of decision, unable to do anything other than to provide to their wants and their needs. Different. It has the same kind of base in it, you know, but that's the way things change, right? Words. It can happen easily. Uh, we hear all the time, uh, well, I mean, we hear of the word queer. Uh, that has always meant to be before, it has been someone who is like outside of societal norms. A little bit strange, maybe a little bit off, doesn't uh, march to co-opt it to mean specifically that you are in a relationship or wish to be in relationship with someone of the same sex. See, so, the difficulty is, is that words tend to change in their meaning. <clears throat> Misunderstood and used by different groups in different ways. <clears throat> Pardon me. So the Oxford English Dictionary defines social justice as justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within society. But it only vaguely defines justice as the quality of being fair and reasonable. It doesn't give it more. A, a more useful definition comes from uh, the Institutes of uh, Justinian, part of the 6th century codification of Roman law uh, by the Byzantine Emperor Justinian I. In, it institutes justice as defined by a purpose which gives every man his due. Many other people accept some of the basic principles of social justice, such as the idea that human beings have a basic level of value. That sounds good, right? Human beings are valuable. Are they not? Well, of course they are. Human beings then, being valuable, must obviously So though people may take some of the ideas, such as human beings have basic value, they may disagree on the elaborate conclusions that follow from the idea of having value and where to even seek value. Uh, the definition used by the moment, uh, pardon me, the movement itself uh, has varied uh, throughout the year and has changed. Um, even within the last two to three years, uh, the idea and the focus in the federal justice movement have changed. It has moved away from equality to equity. Now, I know that you've probably, I, I don't know, if, you, if you've been on the internet at all, 
You've seen probably that picture of people standing outside a baseball game. They're standing, they each have, you know, their different heights, tall, medium, and short. I'm probably the medium, I don't know. And they all three have crates, and that's termed equality, because they each have the same thing. Uh, equity then is shown in the bubble next to it, and the tall person has no crate, because they have no need for a crate. The medium-sized person has one crate, and the short person has two crates, so that they can all see above the fence into the baseball game. First of all, first of all, they should have paid first, okay, people? Come on. I mean, I understand waiting outside for, like, the random fly ball or for the home run. I've done so myself. But anyways, <clears throat> so we are looking from the social justice movement for equity of outcomes. Now, I can also uh, explain to you how even that picture is wrong because it blames the victim for their height issue. And really, the ground even needs to be adjusted to change the foundation from which they stand from so that the person who is shorter doesn't necessarily need more crates, but the ground is higher or the fence is shorter because it's the institution that is causing the issue to begin with. See, that's the problem. The ground is shifting. It's changing. The foundation is moving. And if a foundation is moving, it's amazing how things seem to crumble apart. Uh, so <clears throat> equity in regards to the outcomes for specific marginalized groups. See, the other thing about social uh, critical justice is that it's not about individual merit. It's not about your individual work. It's about what group you belong to. I don't know if you remember, uh, was it just last year that uh, Pastor Adams stood up here and he talked to you uh, a little bit about uh, intersectionality, right? And he gave the example of uh, train cars that were set on a track. And uh, the more of those cars that you can equate to the differences in your life that you associate with, the different groups that you can claim membership of, the longer that your train is, right? Uh, it's the same type of theory. So it, it all stems from the same thing. Uh, there are different groups that you can belong to, and depending on the number of groups that you belong to, the more valuable you are, not just as a member of society, but more valuable as a talking point to prove and show that there is inequalities in the system, and thus social justice needs to be rendered for you as part of those groups groups. So it really comes down to where your membership is. Now, my membership is very small when it comes to that train. I have a number of things that go against me in those groups. I am considered not to be part of one of the marginalized groups because the color of my skin lacks a lot of melanin. In other words, I'm a white guy. I'm also a guy not just identified, I'm an actual guy. Um, and, well, I'm, you know, considered middle class. So I'm considered part of the oppressors. In addition to that, I'm a Christian. Now, you might not think that that's an issue, but it is an issue when it comes to social justice. See, social justice wants to take all of those things, all those groups that you identify with, and it wants to specifically section you into the groups of those that are marginalized or oppressed and those who are the oppressors. We have to find blame. Does that sound familiar to anybody who's read the Bible at all? What happened in Genesis? It wasn't enough that a sin had been committed. It wasn't enough that they hid ashamed but as soon as confronted with the reality of what had taken place, Adam immediately went to the blame game. What? You gave me this woman. The woman that you gave me. 
And then the woman followed suit saying, the serpent told me. See, blame enters in from the very beginning and blame is key even now. If you're going to ensure that social justice has an equity, uh, equitable outcome, you have to make sure that someone is to blame. When someone is to blame, then you can appropriately and fairly distribute their wealth, their opportunities, their privileges, those basic human rights that some of the marginalized people, these groups that you've identified as being oppressed by those that you've now blamed the oppressors for, is, you know, redistributed appropriately into those groups. So this is usually done, um, well, redistribution is generally done by the state. So what does that mean? That means that you enact laws that purposefully look to redistribute uh, what it is that the oppressors have and the oppressed do not have. So instead of any type of specific individual responsibility, you now have group responsibility and you are assigned a group regardless. You are in one of these groups. Individual outcomes do not play into this, only group outcomes. So you can look at some of the marginalized groups and you can see success stories. You can see people who have supposedly risen above the status quo for the groups that they uh, are part of. And in doing so, they should be shining examples of how this oppression that they're supposed to be experiencing does not exist or shouldn't exist because they can show that they have risen above it, supposedly. But that's not good enough because that's, that's an individual. That's not the group. So even though individuals themselves may break out of their groups or become shiny examples of how those things that would normally uh, oppress them are not oppressing them, uh, that doesn't speak to the whole group. That only speaks to that particular individual. But you can't, it's really confusing, because you can't attribute anything to individuals. It has to be to the group. It's ever-shifting. It's ever-changing. Uh, critical social theory is of particular importance because its focus is on social justice and empowerment, and it emanates specifically from a Marxist-oriented institute for social research in Frankfurt, Frankfurt in Germany and in New York. Let's, let's just be clear on that. So then I thought to myself, I'm going to talk about the facts that this is uh, Marxist orientated, and then I'm talking to people that may name, you know, they've heard the term Marxism, but they don't really know what that means, maybe. And so I am the definition guy, right? So um, Marxism is a social, political, and economic philosophy named after Karl Marx. There you go, right? Uh, it examines the effect of capitalism on labor, productivity, and economic development and argues for a worker revolution to overturn capitalism in favor of communism. So just to maybe like super simplify that, according to Marx, you have a capitalist society. In other words, you have people who are in charge. And the people that are in charge are the ones that are in power, and they oppress people specifically through things like religion. Religion plays a critical role in maintaining the unequal status quo. Certain groups have radically more resources and power than other groups, and Marx says that those that are in power use religion as a tool to keep those that are not in power from obtaining power, to keep them pacified. Religion is a tool kept to uh, use to, to keep the, the people foolish, basically, and not concerned with those that are in power. So just be aware, the very fact that you're sitting here today means that you are part of the oppressor as a Christian in today's society. But Christians are supposed to be concerned about justice, right? 
So surely social ills, social justice issues should be within our purview and we should reach out and we should take hold of those things and work towards a resolution towards them. You see, this is where you have to be very careful about the words that you throw around and make sure that you understand what is actually being said. If you are claiming to be uh, those on the side of social justice in this day and age, that means literally that you are taking hold of Marxist ideas which say that you as a Christian are oppressing those who are not Christians. Religion is a tool used to oppress. Congratulations, you're now part of the oppressing class. See, the first thing that you have to do when you're looking at social justice is you have to identify the different groups that are considered marginalized or oppressed. Simple enough. Recent decades have seen the development of ideas from critical social theory to explore questions of gender, power, how gender intersects with your ethnicity, your race, your able-bodiedness, your social class, and other forms of difference to disadvantaged groups of men and women. More of those classes that you fit into. More of those train cars that you can add. Now once you identify the groups, of course you have to identify the group outcomes. How is it that things are not equitable in their outcomes? And you must make sure that you include as many of the groups as possible in this. Then you can actually see if there's an equity of outcomes. The more groups, the more worthy of an equitable outcome in that regard. Next comes that blame game. You have to determine who's to blame for this. Who is to blame for an outcome that does not have equity? In fact, according to critical social justice, whether we are aware of it or not, we are all assigned multiple social identities. We are all broken up into many different categories. We are separated in a different hierarchy based on our social status. We are either in a dominant or non-dominant group. Uh, we are... Uh, you know, racially divided on a permanent basis. Dominant members can bestow benefits to members that they deem normal or within limit, uh, you know, some opportunities to people that fit in those other categories. So we are permanently divided by all of those things that we can call ourselves groups of or fit into those groups. And there is no real help for reconciliation for those groups. There's no wholeness to be found in there. There is no, there's no hope except for just an equitable outcome to those type of things. So persons of non-dominant groups or the oppressed group experience oppression in the forms of limitations, disadvantages, disapproval. They may suffer abuse from individuals, institutions, cultural practices, Oppression refers to a combination of prejudice and institutional power that creates a system that regularly and severely discriminates against some groups, yet benefits other groups. This is a very bleak picture of society that offers absolutely no hope for anyone. You have no hope but be in the group that you're assigned to. According to critical social justice, the poor are oppressed by the rich and therefore they need to be fought for. The rich, therefore, are the oppressors and should have their wealth redistributed. Laws pass requiring that they have their money stripped from them and given to those who have not. This would be then an equitable outcome. So we talk uh, some of the stuff in the news right now, right? The big fur is over the fact that we have two of the richest people in the world right now who are vying to go up into space. Not only that, they're spending ungodly sums of money to do so. That money could be used for social change. It could be used for social justice. It could be redistributed to help those that are impoverished, that don't have enough food, that don't have equitable treatment, that do not have opportunities. Instead, they're well, they're taking a ride. It's a huge news story. I would just like to call your, call your memories back to last week when we talked about what it says in the Bible. Remember Leviticus 19.15. 
Leviticus 19.15 said, Do not twist justice in legal matters by favoring the poor or being partial to the rich and powerful. Always judge people fairly. So just because somebody is part of this class or another class or this group or another group, whether they are oppressed or oppressors, we are to apply the law fairly. Now some of the top issues for the United States that are on the radar of social critical justice, voting rights, climate change, refugee and immigration crises, body autonomy, this is also known as abortion rights, uh, LGBTQIA plus rights, gun violence, healthcare access, Racial injustice. These are just eight of the many different things that are seen as issues within the United States. Now things change a little bit when you go outside the United States. In fact, when you go outside of the United States, believe it or not, the United States and citizens of such are now seen as the group that is the oppressor. See, things change based on your perspective, depending on where you are in the world. See, biblical justice doesn't allow for things to change because your perspective or view has changed. If I'm over here, I believe in this. If I'm over there, I believe in that. God's word is the same no matter where you're in, in the world. It's not a fluid machine. Racial equality, of course, is the concept or ideology that individuals or groups of people have the same moral, political, and legal rights and social value, irrespective of their racial characteristics. Everyone on board so far with racial, uh, racial equality, right? Uh, it is the belief that different racial groups should be treated equally and that no one race is inherently superior or inferior to another. We're good, right? It also implies that all social, educational, economic, legal, or political institutions need to provide equal opportunity and support everyone regardless of the racial characteristics such as skin color or facial features. The byline is changing from equality to equity. So because you are of a specific class, because you're of a specific race, we have to have different standards for you so that you get an equitable outcome now. The government has tried to mandate this through several different programs that have come up. Ones that promote uh, diversity in the workforce, uh, making sure that there are the correct number of different minorities in your your business hierarchy. Uh, if you don't have enough of those, then you have to adjust your ratios and make sure that you do. have enough. This is a way to bring an equitable outcome. By focusing purely on your marginalized aspects, we can then elevate you to an equal outcome that you should have. See, instead of doing away with those characteristics, instead of focusing not on the fact that um, we're all human beings, that we all come from the same place, that we're all created in the image of our creator and have an inherent value. We must focus on those things that make us different. Focusing only on those things that are different is the only way that we can bring around equity in outcome. The key is the idea of value. This value according to critical social justice, is the idea of equity of social value. How is that different than value? Quite honestly, as we talked about last week and as we've talked about before, social value is not the same as the inherent value that we have as created beings in the image of God. Social value has to do with your status within society. Last week I asked the question, how does social media play a role in justice? 
Well, since society changes and things change, metrics change and foundations move and things are fluid, social media plays a huge role. In fact, now if you've posted something 10 years ago that was perfectly innocuous at the time, it was perfectly in going with the way that society was moving, what society was on board with, no one had any issues with it. But now, well you see definitions have changed. So that comment that you made, that post that you made, is now oppressive. It's now offensive. It doesn't matter even if you've changed your view on things. Say it was something that was wrong, that was hateful. Social justice doesn't allow for you to have changed. You are always the same because you're always part of the same group. There's no hope. And we'll go into that more next week as well. The big problem is that society is giving you equal outcomes based on social value, not in spite of, but because you're supposed to be part of this oppressed group. See, we've removed God and value no longer is a stable metric to measure or to assign things with. We don't have a value that is not changing. The only way to have a value that is not changing is to have a value that is based on that which cannot be changed, which does not change. There is only one thing in all of creation that we know of that does not change, that is consistent, that remains the same, and that is our Lord God who created all things and can be defined by nothing except himself. So we know that God is just, and we know that we must fight for justice as well. We also know that God is the one that gives us value. And there is hope for all of us because of his grace, mercy, and love. Biblical justice is not defined by abstract notions of fairness or equality. Those are often defined by terms of oneself, right? We demand justice. Human justice emphasizes our rights, our rights as human beings. But divine justice, God's justice, emphasizes the rightness of God, the right relationship with God. God always acts justly, and he calls on all people to do the same, to always act justly. So while there are maybe some generally agreed principles of life that, for example, slavery is bad, amen, World starvation, bad. Amen. The biblical concept of justice is not defined by concepts determined by our modern Western world. They fall short and they have the wrong measurement. The agenda of social justice is interested in power, not in unity, nor is it interested in any type of biblical justice. The machine can use such taxes, uh, uh, tactics as social solutions to ethnic division in order to obtain the power, because that's how the game is played. The main difference between justice and social justice ultimately is how we define injustice. The Bible defines injustice as those things that fail to attain, to, a, to stand, or to submit to the law of God. We discussed this last week. Social justice defines injustice as the systems or processes that do not allow for equitable outcomes. There's a difference there. There's a huge chasm. If you look at social justice and apply it to the Bible, you will see huge amounts of inequity in outcomes. If you look at Matthew 25, 14 through 30. That's the parable of the talents. Guess what? That's not equity. If you look at Luke 15, 11 through 32, well, that's the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son is not equity. If you contrast this with ideas shown in God's word, as we discussed justice last week, the focus is not on equity. It was in just do. 
It is not in equity of outcome. In all examples we looked at in scripture, the idea of justice had to do with restoring or bringing back into right or correctness. And that always dealt with bringing back into God's own righteousness. Because this is provided as a gift of every sinner who accepts Jesus Christ as their savior based on his grace and his mercy in response to our faith. I'll call you back to remember Romans 3. Romans 3, starting in verse 22 on through 26. And it says that we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. And he did this through Christ Jesus, when he freed us from our penalty of our sin. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for our sin, and people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God is being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in his present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. See, his mercy and grace are not in spite of his justice but because of his justice. He loved us so much that despite the fact that our sin demanded death, he sent his son as a substitute for us. And when his son took upon our sin, Justice was served. His justice was not violated, but instead it was satisfied. So because we are made in his image, we long for justice and should be outraged when we see injustices happening around us. Why do we seek injustices for crime? Well, it's, it's in our very DNA. Think of King David when presented with the story of the poor lamb that was taken around by the rich man in 2 Samuel. This resonated with David because there was an injustice that had occurred. And that is why Nathan told the story to David in the first place, because it revealed David's own injustice, his own sin, his all own falling short of God's glory. While justice can be used to talk about Uh, retributive justice in which a person is punished for the wrongdoing. Most of the time the Bible uses the word uh, justice to refer to a restorative justice. Not retribution, but restoration. In which those who are unrightly hurt or wronged are restored and given back what was taken. Social justice makes claims of restorative justice, but is really looking for retribution. How do we know that's a reality? We well, can look at stuff that is, well, going through our government right now. Uh, there's a bill, H.R. 40, it was originally put forward in 1989. And it has been going back and forth between committees up until April of this year, actually. Uh, supporters of H.R. Bill believe, H.R. 40 bill, believe that reparations would compensate black Americans who have felt negative effects of slavery's legacy, including various forms of racial discrimination and systemic oppression. Reparations by the federal government would offer restitution to descendants of slaves or even all black Americans for centuries of servitude, unpaid forced labor, and sufferings that enslaved people endured. How does that resonate with the justice that we see in the Bible? We must be able to discern right and just using the only metric that is not swayed by feelings. It's not marred by emotion, and it's completely subjective and not objective. Completely objective, not subjective. <laughs> it is our duty to affirm people are victims of other people's, or is it our duty to affirm that people are victims of other people's sin? Uh, should we make people of specific groups into victims of our society to out to get them? Uh, should we be concerned with social value and seek equity of all outcomes? 
Biblical references to the word justice mean to make right. First and foremost, this is a relational term. People living in right relationship with God, with one another, and natural creation. From a scriptural point of view, justice means loving our neighbor as we love ourselves and is rooted in the character and nature of God. God is just and loving, so we are called to do justice and live in love. Not the same. Be careful of the words that you use. When we meet again, we'll continue to talk about critical social justice and critical race theory and examine those more under the lens of our salvation. We've gone over a very brief view of critical social justice, and I think it's good that we now take a few minutes to discuss within our cell groups uh, some of these things. I do have a couple of questions for you, if conversation should low. First question, how does social justice impact your life as a Christian? How does social justice impact your life as a Christian? Now one that uh, we asked last week, we'll also ask again this with a slight change. How has your own sin affected your thoughts on social justice? Last week it was, how has your own sin affected your thoughts on justice? This time we're adding the word social in there. And last, uh, how have you been caught up in the critical social justice movement? How have you been caught up in the critical social justice movement? This is a topic that is worthy of discussion. I have given you a brief foundational overview of these things. There is so much more to discuss and more that we will discuss within the next two weeks.